It's a real honor to have you on. Um, I, I brought you on. Uh, well, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? I mean, I brought you on because you're, you know, I, I learned about the account Boricuas Unidos in La uh, Diaspora. Sorry, my Spanish is atrocious because I'm a diasporic Puerto Rican. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I reached out to the group uh, following it. You, you, your, the group added its name to a letter to Joe Biden, incoming president of the president elect, incoming president of the United States. Uh, you know, outline, outlining some things on the agenda that he should, his administration should um, should tackle as far as Puerto Rico. Um, and I agreed with all of it, right? So I'm like, okay, but, you know, Boricuas Unidos in la diaspora, I need, a, I need to be in contact with this group. So I contacted them and they were like, hey, talk to Edil. Edil, is that how you say your name? Edil, yes. And so I'm, I'm researching you and then I find out you're a NASA scientist. I have some stuff to talk about later. That might have to, might or might not have to do with UFOs, but <laughs> um, why don't you introduce yourself to the to the audience and tell them a little bit about uh, pues, Boricuas Unidos and, and, and the work you do uh, organizing Boricuas in the diaspora. Definitely, Hector. Thank you, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit about my personal background if you want, and then I can tell you more about. Um, the work of Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora, and from there we can we can you know we can go on and discuss whatever whatever questions you have either about Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora work, uh, the Puerto Rican elections, politics, or we're going to talk about all of that. Whatever other. <laughs> we got to talk about all that. <laughs> we'll do. Um, so as you can see, my 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 English is not that pretty as yours. So I was born in Puerto Rico and I was raised in Puerto Rico. I'm originally from San Germán, Puerto Rico in the Southwest coast. Uh, my family is still there and most of my family is uh, in, in, in Puerto Rico in between San Germán and, and the capital San Juan. Um, I went to, to study to the University of Puerto Rico in Maya West and then University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras, the law school. Uh, and then uh, from there, I went to New York uh, to grad school uh, to Columbia University, uh, where I study climate science and policy. That is basically kind of the work that I have been doing for the last five years uh, at NASA. Um, so I came back to Puerto Rico uh, after being in New York uh, for some time and work in environmental legal issues. Uh, and in climate change issues uh, for the government. And then from there, I moved 2015 uh, to Washington DC, where I am now, uh, to work at NASA. Um, apart from that, because I always like to like, you know, uh, differentiate my work, that is kind of my work, my professional career uh, at NASA, and we can, we can talk about that and any questions that you have from more of the activism work that I and we, you know, all of our colleagues that are part of Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora Network and our allies, uh, the kind of like activism work that we do. And I always try to separate those because they're different. <laughs> um, and always, so since in, in, back in Puerto Rico, I went to law school uh, and, and kind of, I practiced for some time environmental law. And I was involved in a lot of environmental yeah, you were, uh, justice. You were a consultant for, on climate and environmental legal issues for the government of, of Puerto Rico, right? Exactly. Uh, but apart from that, even since uh, since I was a student in law school, I was very involved in a lot of like the environmental uh, justice fights that went on throughout the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, and we develop a good network of civil society organizations, environmental organizations, political organizations, community leaders uh, that we that we work on uh, on many of these issues. <clears throat> so, um, so when when we were here in Washington D.C. and especially because all of the things that have happened in Puerto Rico, and I imagine most of the people are aware you know, of all of the, we'll say kind of like the the issues, the social political issues that have affected Puerto Rico in the last maybe 20 years, starting with this economic recession that we have been, you know, for like 15, 16 years now, 
that has led to a big migration, especially of young professionals like me outside of Puerto Rico. We have lost almost a million people. The brain right? drain, right? I mean, that's almost, one of the most yeah. insidious things about colonialism is that the metropolis gets all the talent, gets the cream of the crop. Exactly. So it has been almost a million people in the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years uh, that we have lost. And most of that, uh, those people have moved to uh, the United States uh, and have become what we call the diaspora, the Puerto Rican diaspora in the United States. Uh, we have always had a, a, a big presence of Puerto Ricans in New York and Chicago. Uh, but this last migration, a lot of Puerto Ricans are moving to Florida, Central Florida, and also other states like Texas, Georgia, the Carolinas, and here in the Virginia, Maryland area. Um, so with that in mind, everything that was happening, and, and you know, for us, all of this has a root cause on how you said colonialism, you know, and, and this colonial relationship that we have had with the United States for the last 120 sec, uh, 122 years, um, we we kind of said a, a lot of our friends and colleagues that are throughout the United States. We said like we have to do something. We have we have to organize. And we are here in the diaspora. We are here in Washington D.C. We are in New York City. We are in Denver. We are in other cities Chicago, in the United I'm, I'm States. Chicago, so. <laughs> Chicago, also in Chicago. Uh, cities we have presence in cities outside. The United States, like in Bel uh, cities and countries like Belgium, Peru, Australia. So we said we have to unite our efforts that we're trying to do each one individually, and we have to unite that, and we have to organize, and we have to organize with allies, you know, to try to do work for Puerto Rico from here, from the diaspora, especially from here, from Washington D.C., where you. You know, is the is the the capital of the power of yeah. the federal government, right? And we're and most that building of the, by, behind you that that Congress has the is the is, is the authority on the island. You know, never mind the governorship and all that stuff. The 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 legislature that's cute. The main power is Congress, right? The U.S. Congress. That's right, and that's why we wanted to occupy and space that we have seen that hasn't been occupied by our allies for like 20, 30 years. Um, and as you said, most of the decisions or the most important decisions for Puerto Rico are made here by people that are not elected by the people of Puerto Rico, by people that really don't know about how the people in Puerto Rico are struggling, what are the issues important to Puerto Ricans and everything. So uh, we thought that, you know, we have to bring a voice of, of Puerto Rico here to Washington uh, and to Congress. And I think the best example about that, what we were talking about is the enactment of what is called the PROMESA legislation. That is basically, you know, we are under this huge public debt for like $72 billion, right? And we cannot pay uh, and we cannot also go into bankruptcy uh, because of our colonial relationship. And Congress in 2016 had to enact new legislation uh, so Puerto Rico could go into some kind of uh, bankruptcy. And that basically, that decision, and, and, and this is, and, and, and this is important because this might be the kind of like the trigger for us to say, to say that we have to organize. When we saw that these decisions were made here in Washington, they never consulted the people in Puerto Rico. Right. And they basically approved this legislation that created this, what we call in Puerto Rico in Spanish, La Junta. La Junta. It's this fin financial and oversight management board that made all of the decisions on the budget. And only one of them the was Puerto Rican, budget. right? Only one of them was Puerto Rican. Uh, maybe one, two, or three, but really these Puerto Ricans that they don't feel that they are Puerto Ricans. Tokens, tokens, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, and, it, and it's, tokens. An, it's, it's, yeah. It, it's an embarrassment. It's, it's, you know, it's colonialism, right? America never wants to talk about colonialism. And then, you know, the, the debt, you know, is is a direct result of Puerto Rico not being able to control its own finances, not being able to control its economy. And so now that it's in debt, the U.S. colonial power says, oh, you guys, this is why you guys are a, col a colony in the, to begin with. Let's let's 
impose this junta on you so we can help you how to show you how to do a budget as if as if the problem I mean you hear it all the time right that the problem is that Trump said it you know Puerto Rico is the most corrupt place on earth but it's a colony right and these you know yeah maybe there is corrupt there is definitely corruption in the in the Puerto Rico uh, uh, colonial island government but that uh, that colonial government is authorized by the colonial power in Congress. Exactly. Uh, and what you're saying, totally agree. Very paternalistic, colonialist and imperialist vision, you know, of the United States. And what you're saying, yes, you know, we have corruption like any country in the world has corruption. Right. And the United States has a lot of corruption. We have seen that, yeah. you know, <laughs> especially in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so, but as you say, you know, most of the fundamental decisions in Puerto Rico are really made here in Congress and in Washington. Or if, and it if, was, not, if, not, if not the decisions, but at least the parameters from, you know, from within what, you know, the, the, the limits to what, setting the limits to what the colonial, what the island government can or cannot do, right? Exactly. And we, you know, for, for some time and for the people that don't know very well the, the, the colonial history of, about Puerto Rico, obviously we were invaded in 1898 uh, by, by the United States. And then, you know, for many decades, uh, there was a very important uh, independence movement in Puerto Rico. And there was a lot of struggle uh, in Puerto Rico. There was also a lot of poverty. And in 1952, uh, a new constitution uh, was approved, uh, and there was, you know, this engagement between the U.S. Congress and the government in Puerto Rico by then Governor uh, Luis Muñoz Marin. Uh, they uh, there was a, a constitutional assembly, and they enacted, and the people approved uh, a new constitution for the Commonwealth. And it was kind of a way of the United States because this was after the Second World War and the creation of the United Nations and the and United this is Nations. The, and this is during the gag law, right? The gag law is in during place. During the gag law, you can't you exactly. can't have a Puerto Rican flag. You can't whistle a patriotic tune. And here we are in this period. We have a constitutional convention for Puerto Rico. So you can imagine how limited it is as far as as sovereignty goes, right? Exactly, and then. Um, it was a way, as, uh, as we see it, of giving some kind of sovereignty to Puerto Rico so the United States could say, okay, Puerto Rico has their own constitution. They're not really a colony because it was seen, you know, very negative at that time where all these former colonies from the European powers were getting their independence. And then you're trying uh, to compete they, with Soviet Union. You know, the so Soviet Union is totalitarian america is free and we we respect democracy yeah we, and have, we don't have, we have colonies, colonies in the yeah. world <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly as an, you know I'm, i was born in chicago so you know i'm and i'm puerto rican so as an american it's weird to you know learn about 1776 and thomas jefferson and the declaration of independence and then to find out this same country later has colonies and oh one of those colonies is puerto rico so like i and i you know maybe i it's a Chicago thing, but I didn't meet any statehooders. Every Puerto Rican that I knew that was active was an independentista, right? And and as as an I always say it as an American, as an American, as a Puerto Rican, I believe in independence because I, I I know the history of Puerto Rico and, and you know this this country is not going to make us a state, right? They're not going to make us a fifty first state. They're, they're, they'll make us they'll make Puerto Rico a state after all the Puerto Ricans are gone from the island, right? Um, but. Too, as an American, I believe in independence, right? Because that's what we did. That's what the 13 colonies did, right? We didn't say, oh, you, you, England, you're treating us so bad. Let us become a part of you. No, we want to separate from you because you're treating us so bad, right? Um, so it never made sense to me, the whole statehood thing. Um, as we saw in, in, the, in, the 2000, in the November 3rd election, statehood, although if you read the newspapers, oh, statehood won, statehood won, then you read it only got 53% of a 53% turnout. So, mm -hmm. and 67% of voters voted for the other parties, right? Uh, the Independentista exactly. Party, the Citizens Victory Movement, the Project Dignity. So, I mean, why, do, why does statehood get so much attention and independence not? I mean, I, I know you guys don't talk about independence, but I see your uh, Boricuas Unidos is, is, is affiliated with uh, Casa Pueblo, right? 
stuff yeah. like that, people who are who are adamantly for independence. I mean, why does statehood yeah. get all the glory and it's this tiny you would think if you're not a Puerto Rican, you think everybody all Puerto Ricans want to be a state. And it's not true yeah. at all, right? It's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so a lot to say here <laughs> in, <laughs> about this. I just want no, 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 and, and this is a great topic, and 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 you you hit the nail, you know, in regards of like especially white liberals here in the U.S., you know, people that we feel that should be allies of us in this struggle. What you hear from them is statehood, statehood, and statehood, and there are some. Uh, um, um, you know, I, I I can talk about some of the of the reasons, you know, for uh, for that. But before that, I just wanted to finish. Like, you know, we had the Constitution in 1952, and then that gave us, as, as the government said, gave us some kind of like sovereignty, you know, or autonomy to to exactly the Commonwealth to to to, to do some decisions. Um, the independence movement was persecuted. Um, and then it, it kind of like died down and everything like that. But for a long time, there was a lot of people in Puerto Rico saying, really, we we really don't have that that type of sovereignty to make our own decisions. And so so important for people, you know, to know that in society you can make your own decisions and it's not, you know, other people, especially from other places that they don't really know what is happening there, you know, to make the decisions for you for you. And it was especially now from 2015 to 2016, in the last few years, that there has been a lot of historical um, moments uh, or events that have finally made most of the people in Puerto Rico agree that we are a colony. For a long time, long time, we had one of the main parties in Puerto Rico, that is the Popular Democratic Party, the PPD, you know, saying that, no, 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 we are not uh, a colony, you know, we are a commonwealth, we are the Estado Libre Asociado ELA, right? Uh, and we have some kind of autonomy. Now they have changed that completely because of PROMESA and a decision in 2016 by the Supreme Court, Sanchez Valle versus Pueblo de Puerto Rico, where basically the Supreme Court acknowledged that we are a colony of the United States, and basically the United States can do whatever they want with us. That was that, I remember. I remember that, listening to it was, and it was, I believe it was Soto, Soto, Sonia Sotomayor going back and forth yeah. with uh, the lawyer, you know, uh, the the government's lawyer, the um, uh, what do you call the 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 government's lawyer who talks before the Supreme Court, um, Solicitor General, right? Exactly, in Spanish, Procurador General. And he's explaining, so no, 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 Puerto Rico has no rights; we own it. <laughs> I mean, the, he just laid it bare that it's a colony, right? And uh, and 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 it was it it was amazing. Like as somebody who, you know, you've been reading about this independence, and nobody wants to talk about that it's a colony, and now it's kind of forced with the hurricanes, right? We we saw that the 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 reason for the the relationship, the colonialism, was that oh, we a Puerto Rico needs to cling to America because America is so powerful and so rich. We don't want to be a Cuba taken over by a dictator, and we don't want to be a Haiti poor and can't feed ourselves yet when yeah. a hurricane comes two hurricanes an earthquake and the richest powerful country is our is our stepdad but he doesn't give us anything he just throws out toilet paper so like what's the whole point of it anyway right exactly and that has been you said two very important things that has been in part i think what has um developed a change in the minds especially of the young people in Puerto Rico and we saw it we saw it after Hurricane Maria we have been constantly and I travel constantly to Puerto Rico and we saw it especially during the 2019 summer protests you know that ousted the, the governor pro who governor in Puerto Rico Ricky Rosselló but to talk about your first, uh, your earlier question about statehood and why is that we hear so much about statehood in Puerto Rico, one of the reasons is that is for decades, you know, we have had all of this, the media in Puerto Rico, we have had all of these politicians, we have had all of the, the establishment, uh, newspapers and everything telling us what you said, that we are nothing without the United States, or anything like that. And that has been ingrained in the mind of colonized people for so long. And then politically, politically, since around 2004, 
uh, for the last maybe 16 to 20 years, the pro-statehood party has controlled uh, the narrative of Puerto Rico, especially here in Washington, D.C. Why? Because they are the ones that have had since 2004 the resident commissioner, uh, uh, the resident commissioner of Puerto Rico here in Washington, D.C. So Puerto Rico has one member of Congress that we elect. That member of Congress has a voice but doesn't have a vote in the U.S. Congress. And that member of Congress is selected in the general elections in Puerto Rico alongside the governor. Um, and, um, and they come here to Washington, D.C., and they have an office, and they have a seat, and they are giving uh, committee assignments and everything like that, but they don't have any real uh, voting power or power uh, itself. But that resident commissioner of Puerto Rico for the last 16 years, and now it's going to be 20 years, has been a pro-statehood uh, resident commissioner. And more, more about that, the pro-statehooders in Puerto Rico uh, that are organized on the new progressive party that don't get confused, it doesn't have anything progressive about it. It's a right-wing conservative party, you know, that has been involved in a lot of corruption uh, uh, cases. Um, so, because of they that, have they those are Orwellian. You could always tell a, a, a sinister organization because they have that definitely. Orwellian name, right? So, New American so they, Freedom or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. But they have the wealthy people behind them, yeah. you know, putting money. And what does that have mean? That has mean that they have, that they are the ones that have been for the last 20 years putting money into lobbies here in Washington, D.C. and pushing a narrative that is very... It's very like it's a lot of like half half truths and a lot of lies mm -hmm. that they come here to Congress to say, and then they have like two different, uh, you know, like 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 ways of 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 saying things. They say one thing in Puerto Rico, they say another thing here in Washington. But basically, they have been pushing the agenda because they have the money, and then the independence and the pro sovereignty and the pro status quo uh, forces. They, in the 70s and 80s, 1970s and 1980s, they used to have people here, you know, and pushing, you know, the language and the agenda, but they stopped doing that. I don't know, uh, because of like money problems, I, I, I think the main one. And for the last 20 years, then those pro statehood forces that have a lot of money, many of them, you know, like very corrupt, you know, kind of like shady, you know, things, they have been pushing the agenda unopposed. By no one. And that's, uh, I want to always explain that, that because that was one of the reasons or main reasons that we organized here and we are based here in Washington, D.C. And it was to kind of like occupy a space that has been occupied only by them and they have been just pushing this agenda and this agenda. And we have, you know, we have developed uh, um, uh, alliances, you know, uh, and we have developed like good engagement and relationship with a lot of the anti-statehood forces in Puerto Rico. And we can talk about this, especially in the last year or two years, we have been talking a lot to Congress uh, and, 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 and Congress people and congressional staffers about this topic of decolonization, uh, trying to focus more on looking for a consensus on a serious and maybe binding, binding may be too much for Congress, but at least a serious <laughs> process of self-determination and decolonization for Puerto Rico. And I think we have we have we have come along, especially this year, uh, in that topic. We can talk about the, those referendum results in Puerto Rico that really we think are going to go nowhere yeah. because it, it was a non-binding referendum. But more than that, it was organized unilaterally yeah. by the pro-state who forces in Puerto Rico. It wasn't approved by the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice didn't approve the money uh, that during the Obama administration that they, they promised that they will give money for a referendum in Puerto Rico if they follow, you know, some requirements. They didn't follow those requirements. So the, the U.S. Department of Justice didn't give money. They... In the referendum in Puerto Rico, um, um, they, they, the campaign, basically the pro-statehooders, 
um, put millions of dollars in ads for that campaign, while the anti-statehooders, it was a grassroots campaign. We were involved in that campaign. And you mentioned that we, we are not outspoken pro-independence. You know, personally, I am, and, and, and people know about it, and most of our members are also. Um, we do want, because we work here and we try to work in, in kind of like alliances right. and everything, we do try to be uh, the most inclusive uh, possible because we are talking to congressional offices and we are trying to bring together all of these anti-statehood forces uh, to kind of like uh, agree on the consensus of the process. So we try to be inclusive and not try to push too hard right. You know, on on what is the option that we prefer? Personally, definitely, you know, we 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 want independence or at least some kind of like sovereignty uh, for Puerto Rico. Um, but as you mentioned, those results, uh, I, I don't think that they're gonna go anywhere. Already this week, uh, uh, Chuck Schumer, the senator from New York, that looks like right now he's the minority leader, but. Very well, next year could be the, the, ma the majority Mitch leader. Mitch McConnell says, as long as I'm Senate Majority Leader, we're not going to have a, a Puerto Rican star on the flag. Puerto right? Exactly, because he says that, you know, statehood for Puerto Rico and for Washington, D.C. is some kind of like socialism <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> I thought but, it was democracy, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Chuck Schumer, that might be the majority leader in the Senate if the Democrats win the two Georgia races now in January. Uh, Chuck Schumer came on an interview with El Nuevo Día, that is the leading newspaper, this week, just this week. And he said, he mentioned, he said that he doesn't see that these results in the referendum, statehood referendum uh, in Puerto Rico, were going to go anywhere. And that he has to see consensus uh, from the different options in Puerto Rico, you know, for some kind of like... Uh, you know, to see some kind of like uh, solve to solve the problem of, of of the status question in Puerto Rico. So I think, you know, in 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 what we're seeing and and what we hope to and what we're be what we are going to be working on definitely this year and the years to come is to focus on finding consensus on a process, on a serious process of self determination and decolonization, that all of the op options the decolonizing options uh, agree on. And, you know, if the pro-state hooters, and this is the thing, the pro-state hooters, they have hijacked the process and they always want to push it themselves unilaterally. These, the last three referendums that have been celebrated in Puerto Rico, now 2020, 2017, 2012, they have been organized unilaterally right. by the pro-statehood part in Puerto Rico. And they have not bring, you know, the other options to the table. And they always wanted to do it as they want. And that's why Congress has not been involved in those negotiations. But worse, we, we can talk about, you know, this and, and, and so many things. Worse, and, and this is worse. When they bring the statehood question to Puerto Rico, like for example, this year in the statehood referendum, they say, a statehood, yes or no. But <laughs> what kind of statehood? What kind of statehood? Right. Because they 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 speak about in Spanish they call it estadidad jibara. That is kind of like a Creole statehood in Puerto Rico that is a statehood with the official language in Spanish, uh, with sovereignty on the Olympic team with a national team of baseball and basketball that is something that all of the Puerto Ricans are very proud of. Right. And that's something that we know that is not possible no way. if we become a state. And they have not even tried to ask Congress here, you know, define what the statehood will mean. Is that true? And this is why we talk about these two different uh, discourse that the pro statehoods bring, one to Washington, one to Puerto Rico. They are speaking about Creole statehood to the Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. And they ask like, okay, statehood, yes or no, under that type of statehood. But the United States, if it is a statehood, the US Congress has to approve that. The United States Congress approves of that kind of statehood. Right. We, we know that, that, that that's not reality, right? So 
That's why we want to explain to the people here in the United States that are hearing, you know, that this is more complicated than what you hear about, oh yeah, Puerto Ricans support statehood, 52% support the statehood in this referendum. No, it's more complicated. Like I mentioned, yeah. it was organized unilaterally. They put all of the money into it. Um, the definitions were not uh, uh, negotiated with the, with the other options and were not negotiated with the Congress of the US, you know? And also, we had a participation of 52%, right. you know, in the plebiscite and people in the United States might hear, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's not bad. No, historically, Puerto Rico and in referendums, we have a participation of 70 to 80% right. of the people that are able to vote. And what we believe in is that when we finally have a serious and binding, hopefully binding, but at least a serious plebiscite, on the status, we know that we're going to have 70, 75, 80% participation. Yeah, but that's how and, I saw it. I mean, like 52% turnout and you're only getting a 52% of that turnout means that yeah. only people who wanted to, who are really for statehood went to go vote. And so exactly. that number isn't that big at all. You know, 26% it is 26%. Of the yeah. It's twenty six percent of the electorate, right? And and exactly, it's twenty six percent of the electorate. And if we see the numbers, you know, statehood got eight hundred thousand votes in two thousand twelve, sixty one percent. It's more complicated than right. this, but in the second question, they got sixty one percent, and they got eight hundred thousand votes. And then now in they're the getting Puerto, in the in the PIP, the Puerto Rican Independence Party got more, more most it's votes going, since nineteen fifty two. Exactly. And we haven't talked about that. And, and this is something that we wanted to talk because I know that you wanted to talk about the elections, not only the referendum, but also the elections that we had in Puerto Rico. And it was historic elections. And one of the reasons was because of that. Um, but we see, and this is important that the American people know, we see besides all of these things that really, uh, you know, the pro statehooders tried to hard and with a lot of corruption and, and money and shady dealings and everything to push, you know, for statehood and to try to like give the impression that they have a majority that really they don't have, you know. Also, if we go to the numbers, we can see that support for statehood is kind of like decreasing. We saw 61% in 2012 with 800,000 votes. In 2017, they got 97% because they went to a, a plebiscite alone, all of the other options boycotted, and only 21% participated, and they got 97%. Yeah. And now they only got 52%, 600,000 people voting for them. Um, and we're not even counting, there were 40,000 right. blank ballots. Right. When you count those blank ballots, it's almost 50-50. And we're saying it was a non-binding referendum, there were no definitions. It was unilaterally. It was a ploy for the for the new progressive party to get its voter its, its base. Its voters to, the polls, to, right? to get to to the polls. And now to the important thing, and I think from the perspective of progressives, real progressives, and our allies, the positive things about the elections in Puerto Rico. One, we saw a historic uh, historic support for the Puerto Rico Independence Party that as you mentioned, we haven't seen since the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, the, the candidate uh, for the Puerto Rican Independence Party, Juan, Juan Dalmau, is a young lawyer. Uh, he got almost 14% uh, of the votes for governor. And then also a new, uh, a new party that is a kind of like coalition of progressive politicians and progressive movements and lefty movements that were organized under this uh, uh, citizens, uh, Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana, uh, Citizens Victory Movement, uh, they got 14 plus percent of the vote also for governor uh, with their candidate, Alexandra Lugaro, that she out, outspokenly and expressly has said that she's an independentista, right. that she supports independence. But, and this is important for people to know, she's an independentista, but they didn't do campaign for the referendum because of two things. One, they are a coalition of progressive and lefty forces, and some of them, they, they welcome pro-statehooders. 
there are a few pro-state hooters in their in their movement, not that many, but a few. But also because they didn't see as many of us, they didn't see this referendum as a serious decolonization yeah, they're, they're, and self-determination process. They're more process. concerned with just social issues, making life better for Puerto social. Ricans. They think they kind of ignore the status question because it's been there for over a hundred years, and they it's probably not going to go anywhere anytime soon. You exactly, know? but 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 they have. They have published an urgent agenda, as they call it, Agenda Urgente, with five main points. And one of those points is decolonization. But they support the decolonization process through a constitutional assembly of status. And that's something that we can talk because that's where a lot of our efforts in 2021 are going to be on the process. And, and, and I think many of our allies support the process through a constitutional assembly of status to finally solve uh, you know, the status question of Puerto Rico. But going to the elections, we got that these two, you know, progressive parties got in between them 28% of the vote, 28 percent 28 yeah. of the vote. The governor that got elected, that's Pedro Pierluisi, that's from the pro state party, they he got 32%. Yeah. You know, and this is this is amazing how you get uh, a governor, you know, president or whatever in a country that only gets the support of 32% yeah. of the electorate. So that would not fly in the United States. I mean, no, <laughs> Biden, it's a got, weak... Biden got won by a lot and he's, yeah. the people are still angry, you know, <laughs> it's a weak, it's a very weak government. Yeah. Rosselló, before that, Rosselló was the one, uh, Ricky Rosselló that got also, uh, it, it was 41% and it was also the, the le- uh, the least uh, um, voting uh, percentage that a governor had gotten in Puerto Rico, and we saw what that administration, what happened to that administration. Yeah. Basically, he was the first governor that was uh, that was um, kicked out by 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 protests, you know, in 2019. So now we got a governor with 32 percent of the electoral vote, yeah. and we see this rising progressive, left-wing, anti-statehood, pro-independence, pro-sovereignty. And very popular movements. amongst the youth. All that's very popular the youth. the youth, meaning that's the Ex- future of Puerto Rican politics. Exactly. And and we are, so we are looking forward to 2024. And there is, there is two things that have to happen in Puerto Rico politically. Right now in Puerto Rico, uh, on the electoral side, we are not allowed to have electoral alliances like many countries in Latin America and Europe have that you have these different parties and if you some uh, if you add all of the support for these parties you know that they will be you know the majority so they coalesce and they form a coalition and they go as a coalition in the elections and they win that is not permitted under the electoral laws in Puerto Rico but that can change and we're hoping that that can change uh, and 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 it, it is permitted. And the second thing is the runoff, a runoff election. You know, seeing a governor, you know, having a mandate with only thirty-two percent of the electorate. That's not a mandate. <laughs> that's that's not a mandate. Exactly, that's not a mandate. And we hope that uh, also there can be changes in legislation, so uh, so we can get a runoff election and have a governor that is supported by at least 50% of the electorate. And I think that with those two changes, we can see uh, a coalition of these progressive uh, and left and and, and anti-statehood and pro-sovereignty parties and movements, uh, you know, forming for 2024 and with a big chance of of coming to power uh, in Puerto Rico. And and that will be a game changing. That will be historically. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... The, you know the the statehooders monopolize the the narrative because one you know it the statehood uh, cause plays to the vanity plays to the chauvinism of the United States right of the government and of the of the of the media I mean here here you are Puerto Ricans begging entry into the United States and even though they're not going to give statehood to the to the statehood cause they like you know people like being begged you know like that they like being um, their, their, their vanity played up to and, and and to be independentistas almost impolitic right it's, it's almost 
dirty. It's almost bad. Like, why do you yeah. why do you want to leave the United States? What's wrong with the United yeah. States? Are you trying to say that the United States is bad? No, no. Yeah. I'm just saying we're just saying that Puerto Ricans, like Americans, like everybody, have a right to representative government to govern themselves to decide how their economy is going to run, who has the power where they live, how things operate, right? And that we're still arguing this shows that just like what they said in in the in the um, the, oh man, the insular cases, right? That Puerto mm-hmm. Ricans are just not as a race able. They're, they don't have the ability for self government. So, you know, it's like when you, it's like being a Puerto Rican is almost like being a teenager or being a, a young adult, and you're trying to get power from your from your from your parents. Like, let me go. I'm I'm old enough. I can do this. And your your parents are like, no, no, no. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's not going to happen. It's under Republicanism, under Republican Party, it statehood's not going to happen because they're not going to add another state. Because one, you'd have to bring Puerto Rico's poor, twice as poor as the poorest state, right, Mississippi, mm-hmm. twice as poor. So meaning you would have to bring it up to par to the poorest state. You would have to have this massive influx of investment. In Puerto Rico, investment in Puerto Rico, United States Congress is not going to do that, right? Mm-hmm. And then two, they're not, they don't want to work on decolonization because to say, to, to even in, engage in a process of decolonization admits that America is a colonial power and they can't do that, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's why these, this Commonwealth Party and the Statehood Party just are still, they're not popular, but they're in power because that's mm-hmm. what. The United States government system, its media, its fi- its financial system. That's what, too, right? Uh, th- 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 what we should say this, right? Uh, United States government doesn't want Puerto Rico to become a state because it's getting all the benefits now, right? Why why buy the cow when you get the milk for free, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, and then you have, like you're saying, the allies. I guess we should mention the, the Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act, right? Sponsored by Nadia Velasquez and AOC, um, calling w- the one thing I, I thought was really good: calling for a constitutional convention. Now, 1952. That's the that's the colonial constitution. All great, right? Chile's getting rid of its Pinochet constitution. Puerto Rico should get rid of its colonial constitution. Let's have another constitution. Let's see and bring together all kinds of uh, you know civil groups and 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 business groups and everybody and see. But Puerto Ricans decide. Okay, what it, what do we want? Because you're saying that they want a Creole, they want a, a Hebrew statehood. So yeah. you're saying that they want they want to remain Puerto Rico with all yeah. their culture, exactly. but they want the money and financial and the military security of being in the United States. That's not going to happen. The U.S. Congress will never let never. that happen. You know, you have to become part of the union, you know, so you have to speak English, you know, uh, you're not going to allow to have a uh, sovereignty on the Olympic team or something like that, you know, and we see what happens with Hawaii, Oof. you know, I just native, about that Hawaiians, yeah. native Hawaiians that went from being like a majority, you know, before statehood 60 something percent. And right now there's only 9%, uh, not 9% native Hawaiians living in Hawaii, you know, and a bunch of white Americans that are not really from there. You know, so that's something that we obviously we 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 don't want to happen. You know, and 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 we have to like keep fighting for this. But I want to mention about uh, about that because that's that's very important. The this uh, Puerto Rico Self Determination Act of 2020 of Alexandria Castillo Cortez and Nidia Velasquez. Um, as you mentioned, um, Republicans are not that keen to talk about solving the political status of Puerto Rico. We do have talked to some Republicans, including Mitch McConnell's office, and we have talked to some uh, high-ranking uh, Republican uh, senators and congresspeople. And behind the doors, you know, something could work out. Behind the doors, they tend to be supportive of independence for Puerto Rico for different reasons that we support independence. It's for like other what? reasons. Can you tell me, like what? Well, I, I don't want to call out, but what, what, well, what, what, two of them, one of them is something that I think we can all 
is something that it wouldn't be that surprising, you know, with the racism that we have seen, especially these last four years with Latinos and Puerto Ricans throughout the United States. They, you know, these Republicans that they appeal to their electorate that tends to be very racist in states, you know, like Oklahoma, Kansas, Idaho, Wyoming, you know, they don't want, they will never vote for having a state of Puerto Ricans, of Hispanics. That's something that in their perspective, they, their electorate that tends to be racist will never allow for it. Right. And second, and this is something that they have told us, you know, behind doors uh, expressly, is that, and it's, it goes more or less with what you said before, uh, uh, is for them, Puerto Rico has become, especially the last couple of years, like a nuisance and they have to deal with Puerto Rico and with the public debt problem and trying to put money into Puerto Rico. And so even, you know, that this, there is a lot of like always conspiracy theories or, or half-truths or, or lies between Republicans. They were saying that when they approved the PROMESA legislation, it was basically a bailout for Puerto Rico. Obviously, it wasn't a bailout, right. but that's how <laughs> many of the Republicans' uh, 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 people push it. So they are kind of like fed up, you know, with the Puerto Rican issue. They're like, you know, Puerto Rico, it has become a nuisance for me. If, if it was for me, and these were the words of one high-ranking Republican in Congress, if it was for me, we just, you know, get rid of it. Yeah. And then he said that, no, no, but we know that this is not the best thing for you and whatever. Um, but this is something that behind doors we could find some consensus with Republicans, obviously coming from different perspective, but maybe, uh, you know, we, we can find some consensus, uh, um, you know, for, uh, for moving things forward. For Democrats, it has been a, a little bit more difficult because Democrats have been using the topic of Puerto Rico for political advantage for them. They do think, and this is not really like it will happen, but they do think that if Puerto Rico becomes a state, it's going to be for sure that they're going to have two senators that are going to be uh, Democrat. And this is not, you know, for assurance. And they really don't don't know that well, you know, how Puerto Rican politics work. But they think that. And yeah, because like, of if that's well, if that's the case, why why would they think that if if the if the PNP, which is basically the Republican Party, right? In, exactly. In, in Puerto Rico, they've been in power for forever. So why do you think that once Puerto Rico becomes a state, they're going to start voting Democrat? Because the PNP, well, because the PNP has some people that are, or have a, a lot of people that are Democrats. So Ricky Rosselló is free PNP, the ousted governor, but he was a Democrat. Pedro Pierluisi, that is the elected, the new elected governor, is PNP, but he's a Democrat. Jennifer Gonzalez, that is the Puerto Rico resident commissioner, she has been for the last four years. She was reelected again. She is Republican, and she is our presence in Congress, and she is a big supporter of Donald Trump. So it's, it, it is it is very complicated, you know, those politics. But the one thing, the one thing that is happening is that they think that they can get those those two senators, you know, to be Democrat, and we do, and we know that that's that's not a reality. But obviously, we 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 see it as for them it's just a political game. Yeah. And when we're talking about decolonization, it's not a political game. And when we have had conversations with some of these democratic offices, you know, their language towards us has been even more paternalistic and more imperialist and more colonialist than when we're talking to Republicans. And that has been a big problem. So we welcome the, the Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act of Nidia Velasquez and AOC. Nidia Velasquez and AOC, they have been big allies of us, especially in, in many topics, but especially in this topic of self-determination and decolonization. And we have been working especially with the office of AOC for like the last year or so on pushing for this topic to be a priority for AOC. Uh, and it is a priority for AOC. And I think we are on the same page with them. So our our work right now is to get more uh, more Congress people, especially from the House, to support and co-author this 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 legislation. Just this week we got two more uh, two powerful uh, uh, Congress people uh, to to endorse uh, that 
that bill. So what is going to happen is that bill dies with this Congress uh, that ends now in 2020. But Nida Velasquez already said that she's going to present the bill again in January 2021 with when the new Congress comes. And at that time, we're going to be push, uh, pushing very hard to get that uh, bill to get the most endorsements from Congress people and then bring it to the committee. It will be to the Natural Resources Committee of the House. That's the committee that has the jurisdiction over Puerto Rico and bring that com uh, bring that bill to the committee so there can be public hearings and yeah, the committee the, can, the can vote. Puerto Rico is, is, is managed by what? The Department of Interior or something like that, right? The Department of Interior <laughs> and the Department of Interior, the budget comes from uh, this uh, House Nat Natural Resources Committee. And the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee is uh, uh, Representative Raul Grijalva uh, from Arizona, that he's from Mexican uh, descent. And now that, you know, Deb, Deb, uh, Deb Harlan is now going to be the Deb, Deb uh, Secretary of Interior. Deb and so she's Native yes. American. So she, you would imagine, has some sympathy for what's going on in Puerto Rico. That's right. And we see it as that, I think, from, with her and with Raul Grijalva. Grijalva is also an ally in this topic and has supported this uh, this uh, this bill from Nidia Velasquez. And then with Nidia Velasquez, that has a lot of power regarding Puerto Rico uh, in Congress. And obviously AOC, that is the big progressive Superstar. voice in the United States. I think that with them, we can form a good coalition and push for this bill to be presented in committee, voted in committee, and then brought to the House for voting. And then our big effort has to be in the Senate. The Senate is always where many of these bills die. Uh, uh, work in the Senate, we're already working with, you know, trying to push Chuck Schumer, that is from New York, other senators like Bob Menendez from New Jersey, uh, Bernie Sanders from Vermont, other senators that have, that are from states that have big Puerto Rican populations, like the states of Connecticut and Massachusetts, obviously not Florida, because these senators in Florida are not really our allies, you know. <laughs> but with those senators, try to work uh, so they can present a similar bill in the Senate. And finally, you know, try to move this. And what we're asking for, and for people to know, what this Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act is asking for is that we solve the problem of the political status question of Puerto Rico through a constitutional assembly of status. So it will be basically um, the Puerto Ricans are at the steering wheel. Obviously, the Puerto Ricans are the ones that are going to make the decision, but we have to have Congress involved in the negotiation. We have to have Congress involved in the definition of the different decolonizing options. And the process will be that it is the Puerto Rico Legislative Assembly that will call, you know, for elections for the people in Puerto Rico to elect the representatives to this constitutional assembly of status. And then once they're elected, they constitute, you know, in an assembly and they will draft, you know, uh, the definitions of the different options they have. And this is very important. The bill says that they have to be non-territorial decolonizing options. And what does it mean? That it cannot contain uh, the, the Commonwealth, what we have right now, because it has already been proven that the, the Commonwealth is uh, it's a, you know, it's a territorial, it's basically a colonial status. Yeah. So it has to be non-territorial, non-colonial options. So we're thinking about statehood, free association, and independence. Yeah. And it creates a congressional committee that is going to be composed of congressional members that are going to be negotiating with the elected representatives to that constitutional assembly, the definitions and the process for that then final vote on, on, on the option. So that's kind of like the process and, and we support that and our allies and, and, support and, and that. Puerto Rico's already been here. I mean, like with 1952, right? I mean, the convention puts together a constitution, the, the legislation agrees, and then it went to Congress. Congress, I think, uh, removed some of the more progressive uh, parts of it, and then he brought it back to Puerto Rico and adopted it. But and and United States has also been doing this with uh, in Micronesia, in Micronesia, right? That's right. In Palau, right? It's it's already done this. There's already free association relationships with the United States and its former colonies in, in the in the South Pacific. 
Yes, definitely. And and it, there will be a little bit of difference with the one in 1952. The one in 1952 was to approve uh, a constitution, so uh, so we could give. Right. So in that part, it could give you know, um, you know, really uh, uh, some kind of like sovereignty or autonomy to Puerto Rico. In this case, this constitutional assembly is a constitutional assembly of status. It's not really to uh, to write a new constitution. It will be to finally have a process of decolonization of Puerto Rico. So in a sense, it will be even more important that that you know, like doing a, a, a constitution, you know, it is basically, you know, asking Puerto Ricans, you want to become a state, you want to go independence, or you want to have a free associated pact with the United States. And if that happens, for example, if we get independence, obviously we will write a new constitution about that and everything like that. But it, obviously it will be something historic and that's something that we want to work on. And the good news about this is that for the first time in a long time, all of the anti-statehood forces, the Popular Democratic Party that has been for a long time the status quo party and, and supporter of the Commonwealth, the Independence Party that sometimes they have been very difficult to work in coalitions. <laughs> the they're new, very independent. <laughs> they're very independent. But, but uh, them, the new Citizens' uh, Victory Movement, uh, Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana, all of them that they're all of the main opposition now parties in Puerto Rico, all of them agree that uh, that we should pursue a constitutional assembly of status. So I think we we are seeing with with good eyes, you know, what could happen. And very important for people to know, the pro statehood party won the governorship in Puerto Rico with a weak government, 32 percent. But the legislative assembly in Puerto Rico went to the opposition. The legislative assembly in Puerto Rico is going to be controlled by the opposition. Uh, the House is going to be controlled uh, in the majority by the Popular Democratic Party. Uh, and the Senate is very interesting. There is a majority of the Popular Democratic Party, but for them to have the absolute majority, that is for approving any law and everything, they will have to take on the new minority uh, uh, parties, right. uh, you know, they will need one or two votes from them uh, they to got approve six seats any, in the, in the legislation. legislature, right? Yeah. So they got, uh, as I uh, as I think right now, the my the absolute majority will be fourteen, and they got thirteen, and then there is five more that are two from the Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana, one from the Independence Party, one from the Proyecto Dignidad. Uh, and one independent. But the interesting thing is that all of those five that I just mentioned, all of those minority five, are pro-independence. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's the first time that we have so many yeah. pro-independent senators because even the we had another party that is Proyecto Dignidad, uh, Project Dignity, that is a religious conservative party. The Senate elected uh, that she's a young attorney woman from Puerto Rico. She is pro-independence and she's outspoken about that. So it's so interesting. We have here a pro-independence senator that she's a conservative yeah. and a right-wing conservative, but she supports independence. So this is something that is going to be very interesting, I think, the, the next four years. You, you, if you, like a minute back, you said, uh, you said pro you said the pro prostitute party, and I think you meant to say pro statehood. I think that was a Freudian slip. I mean, I, I call them the yeah. the venda patria. So <laughs> <laughs> something um, exactly, yeah. But you work at you work at the NASA, you know, Goddard Space Flight Center. I'd be remiss to ask you about that. I mean, I I'm I'm an '80s baby, so I grew up with the space shuttle programs, and when I was a kid, I wanted to go to space camp and all that stuff. Um, I mean, so you you work you basically do climate studies there too, right? Because Goddard. Yeah. Um, studies the earth, right? Yes. Okay. So, yes. So, um, many people, when they think about NASA, obviously they think about space, right. universe, planets, you know, uh, the main, the, the, the main, uh, work of NASA is on planetary science, right? Uh, but there is a small division in NASA that is earth sciences division. So basically what it does is studying the changes in the Earth from space. So using satellites, 
that orbit the Earth, using other what we call remote sensing instruments. Remote sensing is whenever you study something without touching, without coming in contact with it, without touching something. So we use a lot of radars from airplanes. Uh, NASA has a lot of airplanes. And we put them on the air and we fly to these areas where we're seeing a lot of changes in the ecosystems, especially Antarctica, uh, especially Alaska, uh, North Canada, Greenland, uh, the Arctic, the North Pole. Uh, and we fly there with, with, with sensors and radars and other remote sensing instruments uh, to get data uh, and kind of like monitor how our changes happening uh, in Earth. Uh, so my background, as I mentioned, my background is in geology, that are earth sciences, and then uh, climate science uh, and policy. So, Because the, the climate uh, change crisis is going to affect places like Puerto Rico especially, right? I mean, we, we already see it. Definitely, yeah. And we, we have seen it, especially with Hurricane Maria 2017, with the severe droughts that we have seen between Hurricane Maria, before Hurricane Maria and after Hurricane Maria. Uh, and that's something that uh, the projections are that, you know, is going gonna, is gonna to get worse. We're going to get more prolonged and severe droughts in the Caribbean, like Puerto Rico, uh, intercalated by extreme rainfall events and extreme uh, weather events like very strong hurricanes. So, um, and... And just to mention a little bit more, yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm based at Goddard Space Flight Center that is just outside Washington, D.C., in Greenville, Maryland. Uh, and there is where is the main work uh, that is being done in earth sciences. Yeah, and there is a the lot largest, of, it's the largest collection of scientists and engineers studying in the, world. the Earth. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, and it's, 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 it's just amazing. Uh, and you even have, you know, uh, some astronauts that are, you know, I use, uh, uh, when fir I first arrived there in 2015, our director there at Goddard in Earth Sciences was an astronaut, that uh, Pierce Sellers, and British, uh, and he had flown many missions, uh, you know, outside Earth. Uh, so it's very cool, you know, having the opportunity to have these amazing scientists around you. My work is, is, is very interesting. Uh, and I think it goes into like my career that is more like kind of like interdisciplinary career. So within earth sciences in NASA, we have what is called applied sciences. Uh, and my work uh, as an applied scientist is basically, and in lay terms words, basically to be a bridge between the science that is done in NASA and the NASA scientists and the decision makers and the policy makers and the users of the data. We try to connect them. So for a long time, most of the data and the data products that are developed by NASA scientists, they are archived in these, what we call data archive centers that really many people outside like very hardcore scientists know about, right. especially decision makers, policy makers at the state level, at the federal level, they really don't know that that exists or they don't know how to use it. So that's where our team comes. And basically, uh, we try to connect uh, the scientists and the data to potential users of the data. We do a lot of training, tutorials. Uh, we get a lot of people from the federal government agencies, uh, state government agencies, local government agencies, private companies, uh, to know about these products. So we do a lot of conferences and workshops to advertise about the products. And we talk to this, the decision makers all the times about what are their data needs and how we at NASA can help them uh, with getting the data that they need for all of the policy and decision making uh, things that they have to like take. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, pretty encouraging also to know that NASA is studying the earth like you said most people just think it's studying space and the universe um like my grandma says why are we going to the moon why do we want to go to mars when we don't know what's at the bottom of the ocean which is true right that's we that's know true. more about the that's surface true. of the moon than we do the, the bottom of the ocean right that's um, true um uh, but and sorry if you know this is where my mind's going and uh, um what do you think about this whole ufo thing i mean it, it's now it's in the new york times so now it's not so crazy to talk about it right yeah uh, i don't know if you saw that documentary <laughs> the phenomenon which is really good um, 
I mean, the, the this is the U.S. government saying that we are being well. There's there there's a technology that is visiting our airspace, and we don't know where it comes from. Let's that's just the safest way to put it. I mean, what do you? Th- yeah. Have you been hearing about this? What's your sense of that? <laughs> well, I know it's great. You know, um, I, I had to ask. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> it's it's good because that's that's something that I've always um, since my childhood. I've been a fan. Of yeah. this, I'm I'm a fan of um, sci-fi yeah. and all of the alien movies, and I'm a big fan of the X Files. Um, professionally, you know, obviously I cannot, you know, this this <laughs> is not and 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 through this entire podcast, obviously I'm not talking on behalf of NASA or any of my work. We're work. just shooting the shit, um, man. We're just chatting Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, also, I don't have, you know, like, kind of like a professional view on this because I don't work on this area within right. NASA. I work earth sciences. But I, I, as many people, I've always wondered about this. And what I can say is that NASA, and not only NASA, NASA uh, in conjunction and in partnership with other research institutes from the U.S., but also from other governments and private institutions and universities, academia, you know, they are working and they have been working for years on the search for any type of extraterrestrial life or planets that could hold uh, extraterrestrial life. And we, when that we was, talk that was about, a satellite in, in Puerto Rico that just collapsed, right? That was that, why it was uh, built, right? To, to I make was, contact. Yeah, I totally agree, Hector. And I was going to bring us, uh, br- bring this up, uh, you know, when we're doing this connection with Puerto Rico all the time. Yeah. Um, the radio telescope of Arecibo was so important for that. One was one of the main research instruments for what is called the SETI program, that is the search for extraterrestrial life. And if people want to know more, you can see the movie Contact, oh, right? Played by Jodie Foster. <laughs> that 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 yeah. is 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 most of the movies shoot there in in Arecibo. Such a great movie. Um, and and it is you know the radio telescope of Arecibo used to, but still to this day is so important in that SETI program search for extraterrestrial life, radio waves, you know, any kind of like uh energy that is coming from the outer space and second not only to this topic it plays a vital role in the search for asteroids and comets that mm. could hit earth uh in the near or, or long term future so uh i think that's uh, that's a very important role uh that the radio telescope of arecibo has something that people in puerto rico should feel very proud of yeah. Uh, and I think that we we hope that you know the science that has been done there continues, you know, and the the radio telescope can be rebuilt, uh, and we can continue getting the science that we have. Yeah, I, 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 I tell my wife all the time and my stepdaughter because you know, people people tend to think that the Earth is just floating in empty space, but no, the space is actually very filled with a lot of stuff, right? I mean, yeah. stuff that we don't even know that's there. And two, um, with the SETI program, you know, we're sending like you're saying, we're sending out all these radio uh, waves and stuff, whatnot, trying to make contact, see if anybody responds. And then Stephen Hawking, he died, right? Before he died, yes. he's saying we should end the study program. We don't, if there's an, an advanced race of people out there, this goes back to Puerto Rico in a way, if there's an advanced race of people out there, we don't want them to find us because look what happened when Columbus landed in America. What, how did he treat the Indians? That's how the aliens are going to treat us, right? Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, we'll be a con- yeah, that that that's 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 going to be the the destiny of Puerto Rico, right? We're going to be part, we're going to gain independence, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> aliens are going to invade Earth, and Earth is going to be a colony of whatever wherever <laughs> they come from. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, yeah. Um. Um. I think that the something important uh, to highlight is that, um, like you and like me and like many people, you know, we do have this kind of like. Uh, curious, curiousness about what's out there. Uh, so I think that drives, and that's very important because that drives a lot of the being curious, drives a lot of the science and the science questions. And from those science and science questions is where we get many of the discoveries. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? Maybe in 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 
what you're asking me, you know, that now some people might, 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 might sound like crazy. Yeah. It's no longer crazy. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I really, really appreciate a lot, you know, and I'm always for like having that curiosity because there is so much, you know, to discover out there. So there yeah. was like in the, in Africa there were, you know, before they, we discovered the mountain gorillas, there was the natives would tell the people, the Europeans, there's a there's an ape man in the mountains, right? And we thought that, you know, the, the Europeans thought it was just mythology, they're superstitious, and then no, they found the mountain gorillas. That the mountain gorillas were there. So like, there there's a we have a what we know about the universe is tiny compared to what reality is, right? We can't Definitely. even see all of it. And yeah. um, but uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Such a it, interesting, uh, fascinating conversation. Good to know that people like you are are, are dealing with. Uh, not only climate science, but the Puerto Rico question uh, makes me really encouraged. You know, I, I, I tend to think that, you know, I used to think that, you know, everybody's ignoring the status question and it's just, you know, people are just playing politics with it. But no, there's people like you who are really doing the, the hard work and rolling up your sleeves and uh, let people know how they can find you or find uh, Bud. I don't hope you, you don't mind if I call it Bud. Um, I like that name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we, we call it but. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. If people want to know more about us, uh, Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora, but, or sometimes we call it but PR from Puerto Rico, uh, you can find us in all of the social media platforms Facebook, Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora, uh, in Instagram, but Puerto Rico, and in Twitter uh, through B Unidos DPR or just type Boricuas Unidos en la Diaspora, or you can visit our website. Uh, it is, let me see if I remember. Yeah, it is botpr.org, or you can shoot us an email uh, to patria at botpr.org, patria at budpr.org. And pay attention because we're going to be very active. We already have many, many virtual events planned for 2021, uh, so follow us on social media so you know about that. And if you want to collaborate, and that's always we say, we need a lot of collaborators. We have students from different universities here in the Washington, D.C. area and in New York City that are collaborators, and we do events with them. If you want to be a collaborator, please reach, out, uh, reach, reach to us through social media or through the email. And I just want to have one last thing to say that I think is very important in relationship to Puerto Rico and this, you know, when we talk about colonialism, that I think is the, is the most important thing for Puerto Rican, you know, to end colonialism in Puerto Rico. Before even ending, you know, really the colonial relationship that we have with the U.S., we have we have to really decolonize our minds. Mm -hmm. When I go to Puerto Rico, and if they if they say to me, and if there is something important that we want to get out of this one hour podcast that we have had, and it has been amazing to talk to you, Hector, is this, you know, before even decolonizing Puerto Rico, we have to decolonize our minds. Mm -hmm. If they ask me, what is the biggest problem for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, now that I have been thinking about that since I was a child, is something for me personally, is something abstract and very hard to assess. Because what I think is the biggest problem of Puerto Ricans and is a direct and indirect cause of colonialism, 500 years of colonialism, first with Spain and then with the United States, is people not believing in themselves and people not believing that they can govern themselves in Puerto Rico. We have to start changing that. We have to decolonize our minds. We have to push for decolonization in different aspects of the life of Puerto Ricans, specifically energy and agriculture. We depend a lot on imported energy. We have to develop and start you know, using our renewable energy sources in Puerto Rico, and that will get us energy independence. And we import like 85 plus percent of all of the food that we consume in Puerto Rico. We have to start developing more food security and food independence. And then that will be a way that we'll start decolonizing our minds and we'll start to see that we can be self-sufficient. The most important thing, the most important thing that you think about is getting to be self-sufficient in Puerto Rico. 
And with that, when we do that, it will be so, so much easier to decolonize Puerto Rico, you know, and continue, you know, on our path uh, to sovereignty. The decolonizing so your mind thing really, you know, I mean, Fanon talks about that, right? But yeah, I mean, the way they do it with Puerto Rico is the way they do it in the inner cities of every city in the United States, right? Where they they colonize, you know, like the way they treat Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico is the way they treat Puerto Ricans in the Bronx, the way they treat Puerto Ricans in Chicago and and wherever you are, even if, not only if you're in, in Puerto Rico, do you have to decolonize your mind, but if you're in the diaspora as well, you have to decolonize your mind. Um, it's just like Malcolm X has that thing about the, the house slave and the field slave, right? The field slave goes to the house slave. Let's, let's escape. Let's run away from the master. And then the house slave goes, what do you mean? He gives me my clothes. He gives me, he gives me extra food to eat. Where am I going to find a better place than this? Right. And that's, that's that, that colonial mentality that we have to, to escape. But thank you so much. I don't want to take too much of your time. It's the day before yeah. for, uh, Christmas Eve, so have a Merry yeah. Christmas, Happy New Year, and I'll stay in touch. Uh, thank you again for coming on. Peace, man. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the time, Hector. Cheers.